Welcome to Traveling Young, and this Tuesday we're going to talk about Mint ID. We're the Youngs. We've spent our lives traveling the world, and in 2018 we moved from Chicago, Illinois to Copenhagen, Denmark. Now we want to share with you how our new lives abroad is keeping us young. Keeping us young. Are helping to keep us young. Welcome to this Tuesday's Travel and Young. And on Tuesdays, we typically talk about cultural differences from when we lived in America to now when we live in Denmark. And this is no exception. <laughs> I want to say in the past, I've done a few uh, episodes around digital Denmark, and we talked about it in last week's video, last Tuesday. And I wanted to bring up uh, something I don't think I mentioned or clarified very well, which is what amazes me so much about the digitalization of Denmark is more about the public sector implementation, which is super important because you have a dependency on the public sector for healthcare and so many other things in Denmark compared to what you have in the US. The US thrives in the private space and there's tons of innovation happening and that's where a lot of stuff is actually kind of incubated, kind of, you know, incubators there in the US and Silicon Valley where so much has actually happened, but that's in the private space. And so what I've been so amazed by is the fact that the public um, services can be so digital and so helpful and done so well. And that's what I've talked about in the past and that's what we're going to talk about today, specifically about MIT-ID. Now I did a video earlier this year about NIMID um, because just the idea of having a universal way of authenticating yourself across all the different secure systems you need to log into, both public and private, to your banks and your citizen service publicly has just been amazing to me. I think it's, it's super, super cool. Um, reduces the cost in uh, implementations for each of the individual private companies that need to leverage this kind of security system rather than having to build it themselves as they would need to do in the US. I just think it's very interesting. Now at the time, I knew MidID was coming, but I was holding off because I didn't know enough about it, but luckily that's changed a bit because the folks at the Danish Agency for Digitalization, I'm going to say that in English, which is hard enough, rather than the Danish version, were kind enough to sit down, talk to me, and give me some details on what this change means um, for me as an expat, for you, what are the reasons for this, and it was super interesting. For sure. Now I want to make a couple points uh, before we get to the interview, which is if you have any questions from what he talks about, Adam talks about, what I talk about in this video, you should definitely talk to your bank. They're the ones that are meant to be kind of the first line of defense with uh, with questions around the uh, um, the implementation and as you switch from NIMID to MIDID, so definitely do that. There might be some situations where you need to go to the border service for some verification of your identity. Don't worry about that for now, but definitely the bank is the first place to ask questions if you have any from today's video or anything else you've, that you've seen. Um, but this is happening this year and next year, and the purpose is mentioned is to improve security from NIMID um, to this new, more secure way of authenticating yourself. So it's basically trying to do effectively the same things, just in a more secure way. It's mostly focused on your app, on your phone, although there are other ways of using MidID, so you can get like what I would call a key fob, which is like a little random number generator. Um, that can be used um, for your code if you don't have a mobile device to, to use in order to generate a code. Um, there's also these bigger for people uh, versions for people that have some vision issues or hearing. It can actually read the numbers back to you. Um, and so there's a couple different ways of, of getting your number as you authenticate with MidID. Um, not just your app, although it's mostly focused on your app. Um, another important point, which is actually a difference between MidID and uh, NIMID is with NIMID, you out of the gates typically use your CPR number for your user ID, but then you can change it. And in the last video about NIMID, people told me I can change it, which I didn't know already. So I went ahead and changed from my CPR number to using a unique uh, user ID that I created for myself. But in the case of MIDID, that's what you're going to have to do. That's for security purposes because it's more secure. If you think about the way how two-factor authentication works is a user ID should just be contained in your head, something somebody else can't easily figure out. And if you have the control to create that, um, then that, you know, kind of like reduces the likelihood of somebody figuring out what your user ID is and that strengthens security. So that's just one difference that uh, I'm aware of already is that you use 
um, a unique user ID rather than your CPR number for your login with MidID. But anyway, I'm gonna stop now because I think it's super interesting to jump into the interview and hear what Adam has to say about MidID. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us today. The first thing I wanted to ask is, what are some of the main reasons why Denmark is switching from NIMID to MidID right now? NIMID is a great solution. Uh, people love it, uh, but it's an old solution. It was launched in 2010. Things happen fast in, in IT and it has to be very secure. So we have to develop a new system to make it even more secure in the future. That's interesting. So how will this help the average person in Denmark that uses NIMID today when they switch to MidID? Um, will they see differences in how they use it and how will it be better for them? It'll be a more secure system. Uh, if you use the app today, 4 million people do, it, it will basically be the same. You'll be able to use it for the same stuff, to access your bank, to access government that you use NIMID for. So hopefully you'll see a little change, but you'll feel a little more secure in the future. Okay, so then what precautions are used to ensure that my identity and my personal information is secure um, as part of this new implementation of MidID? There's a bunch of there's changes in the system that gives you a higher technical security, that gives you better means of identification, more secure means of identification. The whole identification process is uh, more secure. In that sense, the system is more secure. Data is protected both in the system, it's also regulated by law that, uh, that data is protected according to European Union regulation. So you can be pretty sure that your data is pretty uh, secure in, in the system. So I'm really interested, how long does a project like this take? And what's the collaboration like between both the public and the private sector? Since this is mostly used by banks in the private sector, it'd be interesting to know, how does that work as you manage this kind of project? Uh, we actually worked with the banks before because NIMID is a collaboration with the banks. Uh, we started uh, out with the, the banks many years ago. So when we did the MidID already back in 2015, we started discussing with the banks, how can we, uh, how can we do this? Uh, the real work started in 2017, 18, so we've been working quite a while uh, on developing the system. But it's also very important, it has to work for the entire public sector, the banks, the private sector, and we have to go get all the service providers on board as well, and all the citizens and companies. So it's, uh, it's, it's just a, a huge undertaking. Obviously, there's a lot of non-digital people here in Denmark, so I'd be interested, how are they going to be able to leverage MitID if they're not going to use you know, an app on their phone like you and I might do? MitID is used by almost all Danes. Uh, Five million use an MitID system. So we, we're very used to having to deal with a lot of people who have difficulties interacting with digital means. Uh, MitID is basically an app uh, but you can also use it in different ways. So if you're not comfortable with using it as an app, you can get a physical uh, MID ID that kind of gets you the same feeling as the uh, name ID key card that the, may, most people are familiar with. We all also work together with the organizations representing the elderly. Uh, you have a lot of people uh, training elderly people around Denmark uh, at the elderly associations, at libraries, and telling people how to do it, how to get the MidID, get through the process of going from MidID to MidID, uh, and, and also how to use it in practice. So that's very important when you want to get to almost 100% of the population using this system. We're expats and a lot of the things that we read about MidID mention Danish citizens, but obviously we're gonna be able to use this. We use NIMID, so we would of course be able to use MidID, but is the process different for us as expats how will we be able to get rolled on to start using it? The MidID works with all residents in, in, in Denmark. What you need is a CPR number that all residents uh, have. Uh, so if you can have, get NIMID, you can also get MidID. Uh, and most people have NIMID. If you already have NIMID, for most people you're good to go. You can get uh, MidID through your internet banks or through the uh, website. Uh, you download the app and go to the website if you don't have an internet bank, but otherwise the bank will Will, will tell you when it's time to upgrade from MIT to MIDID. So for most people, you're good to go. Uh, there can be one difference. Uh, if you need what we call extra identification, uh, MIDID is on a higher level, and for some people, they need extra identification. For instance, if they didn't show up in person at the Citizen Center, what they got there, then MIT, you, you might require more identification. 
Uh, that could require next year a visit to the citizen center in that case. Uh, for if you have a Danish passport, you can you can actually do it online with your scanning your passport. But if you have a foreign passport, you would in that that case have to go to the citizen center. That's a little, little complicated. But if you got your name ID from a visit to the citizen center, you're probably good to go and could just upgrade when it's your time at the uh, your turn at the bank. We like to include some kind of fun facts about things. So, what is something really interesting and fun that people may not know about? Uh, NIM ID today and what will be MID ID in the future. Yeah, but you, you ask about the, uh, the, uh, the elderly and we actually we, we found out uh, do, do the elderly use a NIM ID and how, how are we doing on that? And you, you know that's actually more than 400 people, uh, 100 plus year people using uh -huh. NIM ID. So it is really used by everybody in, in, in Denmark. The, uh, it's, it's almost the entire population that, uh, that they use it. I know this isn't related to MidID, but the digitalization of Denmark from a, a public standpoint has always fascinated me since moving here. And recently, the Corona Pass is one of those things that I think is super impressive. We've been to Poland, we've been to a small pub in Doolin, Ireland. They scan it, the QR code, and they know exactly that we're good and vaccinated based on the effort that was done here in Denmark and across the EU. Do you have anything to add from? The experience that you had working on that project, um, you know, I, I could I could talk for hours about that. It was just so, too much fun uh, the, this uh, spring doing the Corona passport. At the same time, negotiating the European Union to get it to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In all the countries, you get the QR code to work. Exactly. You know? That was uh, that was a great project uh, as well. Welcome to this week's Try on Tuesday. And typically, we eat or drink something usually, but this week it's going to be a little bit different. This week I'm going to try to do something, which is see how long it takes me to assemble this Stormtrooper helmet. This Lego Stormtrooper helmet. So when I was, my friend Kira and her daughter Annabelle were here in August, we went to the Lego house. I bought this and I've been holding on to it, waiting for the right chance to see how long it will take me to put this thing together. And now is the time. So we're going to see how long it takes in front of me. I have my... Uh, GoPro and my GoPro is recording away and we're gonna see how long it takes me to do this starting well starting right now All right, that's it for Try It On Tuesday. As you can see, I have put this guy together and um, it took me, I think my GoPro stopped working at some point, but I feel like it was two hours, hopefully, I was looking every so often, hopefully I got enough of the footage to see me assemble this thing. But it took, I think it was like two hours and 20, 25 minutes maybe to go through it all. It's not as big as I expected it to be, but it was a lot of fun to put together for sure. And I'm quite proud of myself because I don't do these Lego things all that often. My only feedback of criticism is there were times, because in this case all the pieces are white, and as you can tell in his head there's a bunch of little pieces, and there wasn't clear direction on when you look in the book on one picture to the next exactly what was changing because so many things looked the same. So my only advice to Lego is it'd be great to have a little bit more 
indication of what pieces I'm putting where um, because it's really hard sometimes to differentiate the differences between the two pictures. But I don't do these often and I still got through it. It was no big deal. But I mean, that was just one thing as I went along, I was like struggling sometimes to see, oh, it's this one little tiny one piece that goes there. And it was sometimes hard to tell. Otherwise, it was super cool. And it took me a couple months to finally get around to doing this. But there you go. I've got my finished Lego Stormtrooper for this week's Try It On Tuesday. <laughs> It wasn't too jarring going from Adam to the Lego assembly, but that's a try on Tuesday. I've just been kind of waiting for the right time to do, and I felt like this was the one. All right, so I have a couple um, just observations to make uh, after my conversation with Adam and things that I've read about since then um, that I want to mention. First of all, I, I have to say it's to build a digital project, and I've worked in the digital space. I've built big enterprise, large scale um, web implementations to include mobile and iPads and in-store digital signage, all these elements for big companies before. And that's in the private sector, but in the public sector, it's just, you know, I can't imagine what it would take. I mean, to think about like what you normally, like, you know, years and years ago would seek funding for it would be to build a building that you'll say will last a hundred years. But in the case of digital security, you constantly have to change and update and respond because people, Hackers are trying to find new ways of getting in and keeping things not secure. And so it's just impressive to me that NIMID was there and they've already recognized the need to update and do and build MidID to be more secure. And I would have to assume that there's a whole nother round of things coming in the future. And they're already probably thinking about what the next step is as the needs of security for citizens change over time as digital keeps moving at this crazy rapid pace. That to me is impressive to accomplish in the public sector. Additionally, I think it's really interesting the fact that there's so many different types of users of the system from you know, teenagers all the way up to, as Adam said, people over 100 years old. In a private setting, you might target a specific type of audience with whatever your product is, so you can hone in your marketing and hone in the usability around what that target audience would be if it's a man in their 30s that needs to shave, whatever it might be. In this case, there's no targeting. There's no, the audience is everybody. And so to be able to build something that can be used by the entire, you know, the entirety of people living inside Denmark, and additionally to market and understand how to communicate the rollout strategy for all of these different types of users is also a Herculean task and impressive to do this in basically, you know, a year and a half or whatever, very short time frame. So kudos again for that. And I'm, you know, this isn't just because they were nice enough to talk to me. I've been impressed with all this and excited about all these different things as a digital guy since I moved here. And again, I continue to be. Um, all right, I just want to make one other quick note because um, this has come up and this is a question I had that I didn't get to ask when I was speaking to Adam. I thought about it later. Um, he kind of mentioned it in the, in the case of expats where when you switch from NIMID to MidID, there's going to be like a verification of who you are. And if you're unable to do that with your phone, in the case of you can't scan your Danish passport for some reason of a limitation of your phone, um, that's okay. You can actually do that stuff at the border service in the long run. So that won't prevent you from using the app. It'll just make it a little more complicated to make the switch happen. But eventually when you're switched, everybody will have access and be able to use MinID basically on most phones. And, uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, these external devices if needed. All right, well, that's all I've got for now. Again, if you have any questions, um, contact your bank. They're the ones that are meant to be the first line to help people as the transition occurs. Um, when you've been asked, because you're step in line, uh, next time in line, uh, talk to your bank with questions. And I'm gonna conclude there. Thank you so much again for watching Traveling Young. We appreciate it. And we'll see you later. Bye-bye.